Welcome to the Visiting Artists Lecture Series for spring of 2022. This will be the last lecture of this series, but we'll be starting back up in the fall. So I want to encourage you all to visit the Art and Art History website for more information about this historic program and all the upcoming presentations. Um, we would also like to take a moment to say that we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado Boulder campus is on the traditional territories of ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Utes, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Lakota, Pueblo, and Shoshone nations. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands of what compromises what is now called Colorado. So this presentation will include an artist talk followed by a short Q&A moderated by me. And once the presentation is complete, please type your answers into the chat box to the right of the video on YouTube. My name is Brianna Otan and I am a graduate student in the Interdisciplinary Media Arts Program here. Um, it is an honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Letitia Bahuyo. Letitia Bahuyo is an interdisciplinary artist and object maker based in Texas who started creating and rural Midwest flyover communities. Bahuyo received her BFA from the University of Notre Dame and her MFA from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. A fun fact was that she was actually almost a professor of mine at my undergraduate university, um, but life took her elsewhere in 2017 and she joined the faculty at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, where she is now an associate professor of art and sculpture. Prior to joining uh, Corpus Christi, Christy. Uh, she served as a visiting assistant professor in sculpture at the University of Notre Dame and a professor of art at Hanover College. Letitia Bahuya, yo Bahuyo, engages audiences and connects with communities through her site-specific installations that involve community collections of media and memories through large-scale works. Bahuyo's drawings, sculptures, and installations highlight the impact of desire and the machines that create more desire. Her interest in unpacking value perceptions began with her growing up biracial in a small town named Metropolis, much like the town from the Superman movies, uh, which is on the border of Illinois and Kentucky. Um, her continued research of cultural privilege and consumer pressures yields a drive to both create and question a vision that is comfortable, contained, and controlled. By incorporating recognizable materials and forms, including CDs, artificial grass, and insulation styrofoam, she creates spaces and multi-layered experiences that invite audiences to participate in theatrical re-arbitrations of value. Um, in addition to participating in exhibit exhibitions of her individual work, she is also a collector of collectives. She is currently a member of five different collective organizations and considers this to be a foundational part of her practice. Uh, just to list a couple, there is Project Vortex, an international nonprofit collective of designers and architects, um, as well as TLC Art Collective, a collective of three women artists who combine their individual works to collaboratively design and, and create community focused public arts. And lastly, um, I will mention the Philippine X Artists of Houston, a collective of artists performing visual, literary, culinary, um, based in Texas. And I will allow her to uh, tell us more about some of the others that she might be in. Um, it is such a pleasure to be introducing her today. Thank you. I hope I'm coming through. Am I coming through okay? Hope so. Great. Oh, hmm. that's not what I want to see. That's still not what I want to see. Sorry, screen share. How about now? Hmm. For some reason, I am. Oh, still. Yeah, hey, showing yeah, up. Just, it looks great. Yeah. You can see it? Yep. Okay, there it is. I now see the same thing. 
Um, I'm checking on YouTube at the same time as watching it through the the means of the magic of internet. Um, and so now I can see the same thing. So my apologies for the pause. And thank you, Brianna, so much for the kind introduction. And thank you to Kirsten Stoltz for all of the support to be able to bring me here and to Anna Sukalarkis for the invitation. Um, University of Colorado Boulder has been a wonderful host. And even though we are meeting online and I'm coming to you from the hotel Boulderado, I even have my little cup. Um, and so I, I recognize that in this space to continue the, the goals of being safe, we're meeting online. And so I'm, I'm grateful to be able to have this hybrid opportunity to be able to be on campus, to see all the amazing works that graduate students are doing, to be able to work with them and also to be able to share this lecture with you. So thank you to everyone at University of Colorado Boulder. As mentioned, my name is Letitia Bujuyo, and my talk for today is titled, It Takes a Team. And so I have given other talks about my work, and some of those you can find online. And I wrote a special one for this opportunity, thinking about what this last couple of years has been like. And so a team can look like lots of different things. A team may be a large team. It might be a team that you're born into, that you're hired into. It might be a team that is a small one that works remotely and you're never together. A team might be the people who help make sure that you can move forward in your work. Um, but that teamwork I find has been vital to my practice continually on lots of different levels. And so I wanted to share with you all today about how it takes a team to be able to produce the work and to be able to produce the types of studio practice that I aim to do in every single day of my work. So with that, on the side you're seeing, this is a link to my or a visual of my website. Please check it out if you'd like to see more information about other past works. One of my favorite media that Brianna mentioned are CDs and DVDs. I love working with this material. I've been using it for a little over 11 years as my primary, one of my primary media. And that team that it takes to be able to make these types of sculptures and installations aren't just the people on site. It's the team that did all the R&D for the production of the CD and the DVD decades ago. It's all the engineers, the sound engineers that helped to produce what is on that disc, all the musicians and the artists and the filmmakers that be able to produce all of the data that is then on those discs. And then all the people who market and sell it and to design the, the front covers of each of those discs. And then it's the people who bought it, who desired that thing. It's producing a, a level of desire, but soon after that, that favorite song, that favorite movie might wane. It's no longer as desirable. And in the same way that the CD and the DVD has waned as a primary medium, it still is showing up. It still can do its job. It's just that we as a society have moved on. So I like to use this material as a metaphor for fickle, fickleness within our society, but also fickleness that we each have when we start to include and exclude different components of what is desirable and to acknowledge what it is that we are really after when we make those choices, whenever we let go. So I continue to collect these media. Here are five of the installations I've done in Texas in the last few years. And you can see how each one of them take on a very different format to be able to match that individual space. And so there's so many people that help make these possible. So all of those people in the CDs, as I weave this collective of consciousness, all of that data woven together is in many ways for me a quilt, but it's all the people who are involved as I then tie them together and install. So thank you to all of those people who have made these possible. But I wanted to share in detail, a little bit more detail, one of them. This is um, Tethered Oscillator. It's an installation I did at University of Dallas in Texas um, during COVID, um, during the, the shut, it was after shutdown. But this is one of the only large scale CD installations that I did during COVID, because obviously it was a really complicated time to be able to make a large scale installation that requires people to be together. This is pre-vaccination. It was installed and actually deinstalled both before the vaccination was available. And so masking and whether or not we could be together was so difficult to be able to figure out. So I'm grateful to the, the people who are part of putting this installation together. The title of Tethered Oscillator, tethered for being grounded, for wanting to be in a place, feeling tied to something. And an oscillator within physics is a component that has two springs on each side as it's being pulled back and forth, separating it from one center as the spring pulls one direction and then it lets go as the other spring on the other side pulls. So like a, like a swing, it moves back and forth, but being tugged at. That's the title of the piece. I think of my titles in a very special way as I put to, that as a, another material on the sculpture. In this installation, they're horn-like pieces, as you can see, with an exoskeleton. And I think a lot about material choice. When I think about what is I want to bring together, 
And often in these types of sculptures, I'm using materials that you can get literally anywhere or in any town. And so it's, it's irrigation tubing, it's ratchet straps, it's cable ties, it's fishing line. And weaving those together like a really big awkward sock as I, be, as I create these undulating forms that when you walk around it, there's no magic. You can see exactly how it's woven together. And if you spend enough time, you'll figure out how to make it. Um, this piece wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Victoria Morales. She was one of my studio assistants and one of my past students in Corpus Christi. She rode along with me. We drove the entire way from Corpus to Dallas Mask. So at that point in time, like whether or not, was it safe? Like and what was safe? to be able to be together. Also, thank you to all of the students and the faculty, specifically to Christina Haley for the work to be able to install and to Phil Shore, the sculpture faculty member there who also helped both with install and deinstall. Again, all of these people um, were a vital part of the team, the Make It Happen team to get this piece to stand up. I can come up with the ideas, but again, it takes so many more hands to be able to make this kind of work. And so I'm, I, I have to rely and trust other people to be a part of it and to welcome them into the practice. But what happens when I'm doing that, I get stories from them about their work. Why do they do the work that they do? What has brought their life to that place? And so for me, we are a story making society as far as a type of entity. And so to be able to learn someone else's story helps me to understand not only my story more fully, but to understand what, what their drives are, what brings their work to, to the surface. And so as they share their story and I can then obviously answer questions and share how I make it, we become a team and a community in that moment that they continue to stay with me when I deinstall and those CD pieces then become part of another show. I recycle and reuse all of these pieces again and again. This piece, in addition to that tethered oscillator idea about being pulled in two directions, inside those black boxes are two theremin, the electronic music instrument. So when you wave your hands over the box, it has two antenna on each side, and so you're interrupting the radio wave. And so you could stand between them and be able to stretch left and right, back and forth, to be able to be pulled one way to make sound come out one horn, and then be pulled the other way for sound to come out the other horn. So as an entity as the being part of the oscillator, you are being stretched in two directions, which I feel like the last couple of years, we're being stretched in so many directions. So for me, this was a sculpture that was trying to like touch in on that kind of push and pull. If you had two people in this space, they would be socially distanced. It was over six feet apart. So you could both play the, the each, you know, each of these oscillators as then the sound would come out and be able to sort of like hit you um, from both sides again and again in these wave-like motions. Also, this is the only installation like one of these that has a mosaic on the wall as like the only, I guess a flat version of those horn pieces as a shadow, a compressed version of that same visualization. But in this case, it's just the shiny waves as that root like system hugs the entire sculpture in that space when you walk in. Deinstall is never nearly as exciting as install, but it has to happen. And with this team, they all came together. You can see as we're deinstalling. And there's Phil Shore in the bottom left and his students helping with loading up in my trailer. And then on the right, Josephine Durkin, she's a professor over at Texas A&M of Commerce. She drove over. Commerce is not too far from Dallas. And so she was so kind to come over and spend time. And so if you are ever in the vicinity of when I'm installing, if you'd like to be part of my team in the future, I would love to be able to work with you and to be able to welcome you to my team. Um, and so as those opportunities grow, um, I love it whenever those teams also add more voices to it. So thank you to all of these people for helping out. And did you notice on the ground, there's all those CDs. I will break hundreds of CDs in any of these shows, both install and deinstall, and I save all of them because even though they're no longer wanted, they did serve their own purpose. And now there's a fragment of memory that I can't access anymore. I can't get to it because now I can't play it or even try to. It had holes drilled in it, and then now it's scratched and now even broken but there's still data, it's a silent memory within it. And so I collect all of those. I have boxes and boxes of broken ones. And I then go through and I collage those into sculptures like this one. This is about six inches tall. Um, it's titled, You Can't Hurry Love. And so as I was going through all the CDs, I found that song title alongside, like within the text. And so if, at the very top step on the staircase, it says, You Can't Hurry Love. And so thinking about that title, that song, all the memories I have of that song, thinking about like the, the way that you have to walk sort of trepid, you know, in a trepidatious way, like easing yourself up because you can't hurry love, even though you might want to at times. So I love making little sculptures like that out of all of those fragments.
Another team that I love getting to be a part of and that it's an honor to be um, connected to is the faculty and the students that I work with in sculpture at a and Corpus Christi. So this is Tamu CC 3D. Um, last year, Jason Valdez at Victoria College, Victoria, Texas is about two hours north of Corpus Christi. They extended an invite for an exhibition and I asked if I could turn it into a group show. And so with that group show, it was featured the faculty teaching sculpture, Richard James and David Hill, and the graduate students that we have in, that were working in sculpture during that time. And so as you can see in this video, um, Amelia Key and Olivia Hinkle, their work. And then next is Jackie and the Guerreros. And then next in a second, you're going to see more of Amelia Key's installations. Oh, and then there's a cameo of my daughter. Um, and then moving on, David Hill's installation. Then most to Richard James and then myself. As we are working together to install, we are then seeing work that usually we just have to we get to see inside the studios, inside as we develop individually our work, questioning, critiquing the graduate students, working separately. And I I just recognize how beneficial it was to have this show as we then drove up to Victoria, installed, curated together, seeing our work together in that same space has been was been very beneficial. But also we got to work together in a way that they are part of that network. So as I would share on social media what it was was going on within our work, then they are my students are part of our network. Similarly, literally like a week and a half ago, we were in San Antonio and Doc Space Gallery welcomed us to show there. And so this is a combination show between Texas A&M Corpus Christi Sculpture and University of Texas at San Antonio Sculpture. Myself and Buster Graybill and my colleague, April Livingston, we curated graduate and undergraduate students at those two institutions. And here is an image of them at the opening last week and being able to connect that network. Sometimes we can find opportunities to be able to let our teams grow. How can I as a professor help to link their networks together and to be able to create more opportunities for their teams to start to recognize all the good work. Often as artists, we work sometimes in isolation, sometimes it feels like we're by ourselves. And so ways that we can start to connect and share, be a little bit more vulnerable about what it is that we're doing, but then also put our work next to somebody else and start to have that conversation about how our work communicates, connects. And so I'm grateful to Doc Space Gallery and Bill Fitzgibbons and for this San Antonio launch of our group joint show. And, oh, and the team that Brianna mentioned earlier, I wanted to share a little bit about, these are all things that have been happening in the last year and a half. And so rather than showing what led up, I just wanted to really share how the last year and a half has been really fruitful, but also again, it has taken a lot of people to make these things happen. And also welcoming other people to be part of that conversation. During COVID, myself, Tiffany Black and Christine Wilson, we've gotten together to create a new collective as, as Brianna mentioned at the opening introduction. Um, we call ourselves TLC for our initials, and Tiffany at the time was based in New York and Brooklyn, um, is now in Indianapolis, where she has a residency with Big Car and has a house and a studio and works with the communities in Indianapolis for this year. Christine Wilson is a landscape architect in Boston, and then myself a sculptor based in Texas. And the three of us, although we have very separate practices, when we come together, I think of it as we combine our superpowers and design a unique new works that build upon what it is that we bring to the table. And so what you're seeing here is when we installed in Santa Fe, New Mexico last year, um, our, our sculpture, our joint sculpture was titled Infinite Green. And this was the first time that we were able to be together in the same space, working together. Up until then, all of the planning we had done was all entirely via Zoom, phone calls and text messages. So being able to be together and to support each other and to be able to build and exhibit and to install was really, really giving. Um, and the next exhibition we're going to be installing or the next public work is actually in Russellville, Arkansas. Um, we're going to be creating a series of bike racks for Russellville. And then this installation of Infinite Green is next moving to O'Fallon, Missouri. So we continue to work together as we um, create and design and collaborate. And so they are a fabulous team. I encourage you to check them out, look them up. And if you think of anything else uh, as far as locations you'd recommend us to take a look at, please, please send it on. Fountainhead residency. So uh, about a year ago, I got to meet um, Anna Sukalarkis and Alicia or Alicia Sicleanus Carter all online on Zoom as we were anticipating 
being accepted to the Fountainhead residency. Fountainhead is a wonderful residency in Miami, Florida, and we were able to live together in Fountainhead's home or in the home of that residency in, in Miami and get to know more about the Miami art community while we made art in those studios. Thank you so much to Dan and Catherine Mikesell for all that they do for this organization and for selecting and for the jurors selecting us to be together for this one specific month that was focusing on BIPOC mothers. And so it was an inaugural group themed show. And I recognized that it was an opportunity to create, again, a new discussion. I'm grateful to Anna and to Alicia for um, the work that we did together, the discussions and the vulnerability that they helped me be able to open up within my own studio practice. In there, I could not carry over with me all of my CDs and DVDs or the large scale sculptures I make, but I one of the materials I also collect are player piano rolls. They are on the timeline of the history of the CD. They too, like the CD and DVD, have data within it. So those little holes that you can see on the image, those little holes would allow for air to pass through to indicate which piano hammer to be able to drop to make the sound, the song play. So we would hear then what the original recording, in this case, recording those punched holes would then create again. And so all of the roles I collect are too fragile to be able to play. I've gotten one or two to play at least one time through to record, but most of them, I have to be really careful when I draw on them. And so up until now, I've been drawing and then framing them. One of the things that I sought to do while at Fountainhead was to find a way to make them a little bit more durable where they didn't have to be frozen between a frame. And so opening up a discussion about how to be able to do that, um, I'm so, so thankful to Tom Virgin. He's a printmaker in Miami and his studio is not far from the Fountainhead residency location. And so I was able to go to his studio and pitched a couple of ideas about how I was thinking about paper and sought help. And thanks to Tom's work and welcoming me to utilize his materials, I started adding beeswax. And so this piece and this piece you can see um, are layers of more than one player piano roll with an ink drawing in response to the lyric. The lyrics would have been the original karaoke that you would have sang along. So this one reads, you say, oh, I can't read it. I don't have my glasses on. Hold on a second. You say goodbye, dear, leave me with a smile. And so that would have been what you would have said. I have no idea what the melody sounds like. I don't know what that song was, but there is again, memory in there. And so how can I use those lyrics, that poem, that song as inspiration? And so in that case, I was drawing these Cape Cod houses in response that were stacked on top of each other, um, like an endless column, but a flat graphic one. And so in this case, I'm taking the lyrics of one of those player piano rolls, and this is four sheets that are then combined together into a visual poem. And thanks to my husband, Joshua Hamilton, who is a, a poet and a creative writer, he works a lot with visual poems and through his collaboration and team and support, um, I've been working on finding my voice sometimes through text and how do I include that more. In this case, I'm not directly writing it, but I'm collaging and finding text and putting those together and showing these in this sort of raw naked form. So thank you again to everyone at Fountainhead Residency and everyone that we were able to connect with. And thanks to Anna for that opportunity to live together it led to me being here with you today because that was where my invitation came from for this talk. So thank you so much for the invitation. And here, right after finishing at Fountainhead last summer, this is kind of like a, like a PowerPoint or like a slideshow of travel in a way. But again, as things started to open up, how we wanted to connect together, how those teams would allow us to be able to create and connect in a way that I feel during shutdown, the desire to be tighter, to want to reach out, um, I think was amplified in a way because it was lost. And so that's why when I think about this title, it takes a team, I think in the last year and a half, as then we try to find ways that were now just finally opened up, I, re I recognize how much more important, I think they've always been important, but really taking the time to acknowledge that all of the things I do can't happen in isolation. I need so many people to be able to be where I am today, who've gotten me here and continue to help move me forward. Sculpture Trails is one of those spaces. This is a space in Salisbury, Indiana that are known for the sculpture park, for the residencies, for the workshops, and a lot of metal pouring. And so 
during a week long residency and workshop there, I created this, a series of pieces, but one special, special one that I could not have done on my own at all. Here's the mold being stacked up. It's a multi-part mold. Memory serves, I believe there were 38 parts that were all connected together in this mold. And on the side, you can see it being poured. I'm up top on top of Lady D furnace. I'm helping, there's me in the yellow jacket watching my piece get poured. Thank you to everyone on this crew. And with iron pours, again, that is something that you 100% cannot and should not do by yourself, especially at this scale. And so being able to have this this sculpture, here it is after it was just pulled out of its mold. And I'm still working on building up the rest of the installation components that will go around this sculptural form. Here's another of the pieces that I made at Sculpture Trails last summer. It's titled Two Story Excavation. And in this, you can see that Cape Cod house showing up again in another way. So that house that was stacked up is in response to that drawing I did at Fountainhead. So as a Fountainhead, I then made molds off of little houses that were from like a, like a train set. And so I made a mold off of that. And then I made a cast off of that mold. And I used both of the silicone cast and mold to make all of the molds that happened at, at Sculpture Trails. And so for me, all of these are connected together as a larger body of work. And right now, those pieces are on exhibit in Springfield, Missouri. In the background, you can see Jen Peake. She's one of the graduate students that was in that image earlier uh, at San Antonio. So she's one of the graduate students that was in that exhibition. And she's helping me. She traveled with me to Springfield, Missouri to help install as one of my team for that, that exhibition. And so in this show, I it was about collected memory. So I pulled together a variety of pieces that normally I would not show together, but for them, I brought together a series of pieces that for me have a dialogue about collecting memories and the idea of how do we collect story. And so within each of those memories, there are stories that I have, but they're often stories of other situations, of other situations that I experienced, moments of struggle, moments of confidence, moments of failure. Um, and so putting all of these together helped me to reflect that can only happen thanks to the team that was there that invited me for this exhibition. So thank you so much to Jody Lynn McCoy, as well as to Deidre Argyle at Missouri State University for this opportunity. And there you can see Jen helping install some of those beeswax pieces from Miami. And here's some of the iron pieces that were made at Sculpture Trails, finished up um, on, on insulation styrofoam. And so it's titled Tip of the Iceberg. And so this excavation, those are upside down Cape Cod houses. So using one of the casts that I made from that house, um, but using it as a, as a positive that was that pushed down into the mold. And so playing with the idea of positive and negative, but what is it that we either remove or what is it that we reveal with something that was going on in all of these pieces as they continue to stack on top of each other. Something else that I've been also working with in the last year and a half is going back to these sculptural benches. Um, thanks to Houston, Texas, specifically the Houston Heights area and the True North um, Sculpture Series is an outdoor sculpture opportunity. They invited me and carried me into that exhibition series in 2020. Case in point, as far as like moments of specialness, I installed that those three sculptures in Houston one week before shutdown. And so at that moment, COVID was still sort of like this like dialogue on the news, but it wasn't present yet. And so I, I think of that installation very wistfully. And so that installation was up throughout that first year of shutdown or those months of shutdown. Um, but it ended up being actually kind of right because it's uh, helpful for the community because it's an outdoor sculpture that you can sit on, jump on, stand inside of. And on the right, the same series is now installed in Springfield, Missouri. They're about ready to come down. And that's how you sit inside of them. This is how they're made. And so down below, um, you can see that it's a welded base. And then each of the tubes, these are PEX tube. It's a type of water pipe that's usually behind the walls or under the floor. Some a material that's ignored until something goes wrong. The second your water doesn't work or that something is wrong within the plumbing, then we pay a lot of attention to the water pipe. But before then, it's something that we just expect to do its job. And so I like to look for materials like the CD and DVD, like the player piano roll, like, like these types of ideas. How can I bring that to the table and give it another voice, another moment, another way to engage with an audience? And so in this case, you can sit on it. It's all held together with tension and then hardware that bolts it into that framework. This is the most recent installation of these. It's an indoor version of these blue sink, blue sinky sculptures. 
um, that are, these two are at the Art Museum of South Texas in Corpus Christi. So it's only like 20 minutes from my house. Um, it's in an exhibition titled Texas Artists, Women of Abstraction. And so thank you so much to Deborah Fullerton and to Sarah Morgan for including me in the show. I lovingly joke that every year, every other year, the art museum features a show of the faculty in the biannual exhibition of the faculty members. Um, and so even if they didn't like me, they didn't have to show me. And so that's why I meant so much whenever they it called and asked if I would be willing to be a part of this exhibition because they could have chosen anyone. And so seeing me and seeing my work um, and acknowledging that I could be included. But when they called and first asked, when, De when Deborah reached out, I, I questioned it because I don't see myself necessarily as an abstraction based artist. I definitely have abstraction within the work, but um, I, I was, you know, not fully confident. And so through that team, through the art museum, having the discussion, thinking about what it is that I was doing and how it is I could contribute to that show means so much to be able to bring this work that wasn't even, it wasn't on my purview because I've always made those sculptures for an outdoor type of experience that you saw. So bringing it indoors and then thinking about like, well, I can't just put those on the ground. What is it gonna go on? And I did one of these before years ago that had an artificial turf grounding. And so in this case, it has islands of artificial grass surrounding the blue slinkies. Um, and for me, this is because of thinking about hurricanes. You're like, why is hurricane part of this title? The reason that hurricane's part of the title is that I think about that slinky form, that, that sort of calm in the center of it, of that spring. But I was, I also like to think about the way of watching weather.com makes a storm that's really dramatic and super painful and scary seem like a game as you watch it sort of spiral in. And the first hurricane I was ever even close to was Hurricane Harvey. I moved to Corpus Christi and two weeks later, that was the welcome party as far as here's what a hurricane's like. Growing up in the Midwest, tornadoes, that I've seen, but I'd never seen a hurricane, especially not at that level. And so watching all of that, it, it seemed like a like this beautiful form, but recognizing that eye of the storm, that calm that we, we seek, but sometimes we have to go through that pressure and stress to be able to get to it. And so thinking about all of those things is where that title, that blue skies, looking for something next, looking for that calm. Um, and with a slinky, I think about that sp uh, spring, how far can you stretch a spring till it can no longer go back and be itself. So all of these ideas are wrapped up in the way that I think about those benches. And to give it a ground underneath, what you're seeing here is an image, an abstraction of the maps of the water levels during Hurricane Harvey, 128 hours is the smaller one, 128 hours and then 160 hours um, into the storm as far as like the size and the patterns and the rings. But switch that into artificial grass and made these rugs that fit underneath the sculpture to save the ground, but then to also give a sense of place to this, this slinky bench sculpture that can create a, a space of sitting. That artificial grass has continued to be a part of my practice since 2018, but it's been growing. Huh, pun intended, maybe. Um, the artificial grass doesn't grow, but the idea is utilizing artificial turf definitely has been growing. Right now, I'm showing also with Land Report Collective. This is one of those teams, those collectives that Brianna mentioned, that how I collect collectives. And so this team is a really important one to me. Land Report Collective is a group of artists ranging from Wyoming. Three of the members are in Wyoming, two in Tennessee, and myself in Texas. To this day, all six of us have never been in the same space together, but we continue to challenge. And so sometimes we need teams to be able to challenge, to be able to push our work forward, to be able to see what it is that we're after. And after, while you're in graduate school, myself included, you get to bring people in, you know, to be able, like, like myself, to be able to come here and to critique. Everyone's interested, but then sometimes after school, how do you keep challenging? How do you continue to push that envelope? How to be able to create moments where you start to question what it is that you're doing within the overall scope? And so Land Report Collective as a team, we continue to question land, land use, land ownership. And so as we each dialogue about that, we then create works that are individual that we show together. So right now we are showing this exhibition in Indianapolis and I am showing more artificial turf. Once I made that piece for the Art Museum of South Texas that was finished in January, just a few months ago, I had artificial grass everywhere. Um, and so I was like, how can I continue to really think about different patterns, corduroy mowing patterns? 
And for me, this artificial turf thing started because I hate mowing. I like just the idea of mowing and like all of the, the scope that of landscape ownership of, of yards of comparing. It's just such an ingrained component of the American dream about being able to contain, but then also comparing. But at the same time, I so do it. I, I want the yard to look nice, but like, where does this come from? Uh, as far as like a scope, a desire that I want. And so I, I think a lot about that. That doesn't mean I'm gonna change it, but I wanna be aware of why this is a system within our culture that is a multi-billion dollar component within our GDP to be able to get us to buy all of those things, to be able to have that yard view. Within that, I also think about like different materials, like that piece you saw that TLC did, the, those turf rolls about artificial turf, um, and another way to capsulate and to hold and to control a type of nature, but then also in a way that you don't have to water. And so it keeps it perfect at all times, that desire for it to be the same every day. And so acknowledging some of those types of levels of want. Um, I think about artificial turf in a really sort of a really palpable way, a way that you can control and contain this view of nature. And the goal of making it look more and more natural, I find fascinating within what, the way that they're able to weave, these companies can weave all of that together. I'm grateful to the artificial, the Island Artificial Turf Company. This is an artificial turf um, construct, uh, contractor company in Corpus Christi. And whenever they install a space, there's always a few remnants um, left over because you always have something that you have to cut around. And so I'm grateful that they continue to donate to me whatever doesn't get utilized. So instead of it being thrown away or not used, I seek ways to, like the CDs to bring it to the surface to make it special. It's not that little piece of turf's fault that it was one inch over or two inches like from that center, it wasn't needed. Can I bring it in and make it special? Because it is a, a product of petroleum that has been part of our, our landscape, has been shifted and changed, but rather than throwing it away, it is a product. So how can I question that product while using that product? And so it's, sort of, it's reflective in its own way and reflexive, but trying to find a way to create patterns of being like in this visual vortex of, patterns of corduroy as that cycle pushes into that composition. I just love these series of pieces that are right now at the Alexander Hotel in downtown Indianapolis. And here's this amazing Make It Happen team. Um, this is 60 on Center is Mike Barclay, the curator. He's the one in the hoodie um, and the red shirt in the bottom right of your screen. Um, this team made it possible, these columns that were installed on site, if it wasn't for my team back in Corpus Christi, Juliana Fuller and Amelia Key, um, who have been past, past and present students and studio assistants um, to be able to help prep for the show. But then on site, Tiffany Black, who's also part of TLC, Mary Lou Carrera, Brent Aldrich, and Mike Barclay, they helped make sure that all of the columns were skinned in this blue tarp astroturf combination, thinking about the way that we cover up. And so the bungees that hold these up around it are strapped on on two sides, um, covering the columns in this new landscape just for um, a couple of months that will then be rolled up. They're runners, kind of like runners down a hallway. And so then they'll be rolled up and then they can be reinstalled in different fashions. So I really appreciate them as a team and I couldn't have done it without them. Thank you so much. So that has been a nutshell of the last year and a half of the things that I've been producing in my studio and beyond my studio. And it couldn't have happened again without all of those people supporting and bringing it to the surface, bringing that opportunity out. Other opportunities I wanna bring your attention to are um, International Sculpture Center. So this is another team that I am grateful to be a part of. Um, as they've been working on creating virtual events to be able to highlight conversations and communities. Um, this coming Friday, April 22nd, which might be past if you're watching a recording of this, but you can also go to their website to be able to watch this panel talk. Aurora Robeson, who is an artist in upper upstate New York, who is the founder behind Project Vortex. Project Vortex, that collective that Brianna mentioned earlier, is a, a group of artists, national and international designers and artists who work with plastic. And so I'm grateful to be one of the members of that collective. And Aurora has brought together a group of us. They're gonna be having a live panel talk 
um, through ISC. So if if you can, please come and join, or if it's in the past, watch it, um, the recording. And I'm, I have no doubt that thinking of Aurora and thinking of these other artists' works, I've never met them. I've only seen their artwork. And so being able to have this upcoming conversation and being a part of that conversation and team is a table that I look forward to being able to have a dialogue about plastic. Where does it go and the problems, the, the different compositions that we are able to create, but thinking about the safety considerations and the responsibility of our choices as artists. So please join us for that talk. Two other groups, I'm almost done. Two other groups and teams that I wanna bring attention to and to bring into the space, Public Art Dialogue and Mid-South Culture Alliance. I had the honor of working on both of these boards. Public Art Dialogue, one of the roles that I serve on that board is to create um, opportunities for young public artists to, and not necessarily young, but emerging public artists to be able to have reviews with curators, public art directors, and um, other artists who work within public art to be have their portfolios reviewed to get advice. And so if you are one of those people that might want that discussion, please reach out. We're going to be having those reviews um, each year and you get to be teamed up with a potential mentor. Ms. South Sculpture Alliance, I've been on their board for a few years and I also get to serve as the vice president for that fabulous organization. And one of the graduate students I met with today here at University of Colorado is Amy Hoagland. And you'll see Amy's name on this list. Um, also looking at these other ones, I think of all these amazing emerging artists. We have a scholarship opportunity within Mid-South Sculpture Alliance. And so something that I feel Mid-South Sculpture Alliance does a really solid job of is how do we move forward? How do we bring the next team up? Who, when we move on off of the roles that we're in, how is the next group of artists going to be ready to take our spots as professors, as mentors, and also as board members of MSA? And so the scholarship opportunities that they provide are great opportunities for these emerging artists to not only get funding, but also to get mentoring session. If they're selected, they do an artist talk at the next conference and they get to be a part of an exhibition. I'm bringing this up because applications are due May 1st. So those of you who are students, please check their website out, check it out. Ask Amy if you're here at University of Colorado um, about that experience of being one of the scholarship recipients and check out Mid-South Sculpture Alliance. Again, these two organizations have been ones that have been teams that I really enjoy being a part of. So with that, I'm gonna close with the encouragement to find your team or teams. Who is it that you can bring into your space? And again, it, it doesn't necessarily be always in person, it can be remote. It's the people acknowledging who it is that bring you and your best work out. How can you keep moving towards tomorrow? As moments of struggle, moments of isolation, moments of exclusion, because we all feel struggle, we all feel pain. We too are human, we just might not show it. We might put the right filter on, on Instagram or social media. We might find ways to be able to spin our story, but we need a team. That team shows up in lots of different ways. And also with that, how can you be a team for someone else? So with that, I wanna say thank you so much for your time. And if anybody has any thoughts, questions, or suggestions as we move forward as a team, please, let, please type it into the chat or reach out, follow my website or follow me on Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this presentation. I, I knew it would be good. <laughs> I knew it would be good. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing all these opportunities with us. Like, uh, that's amazing um, and amazing to know about. Um, well, first, I have a question for you, um, but we do have a comment that I would like to address really quickly. Um, Brent says, this work rules, Letitia, and you rock too. <laughs> uh, I agree. Um, uh, but what I wanted to ask you is um, if you could talk a little bit about the importance of scale in your work. So I know a lot of the sculpture that you have uh, showed is, is are very like large scale pieces, but you also work on sort of smaller scale pieces. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if you could just talk about that a little, what importance that holds for you? Absolutely, Brianna. Um, scale is really important. I think, you know, um, we talked about in my intro, you mentioned theatricality, like a theatrical rearbitration of value. And when I think about that is within theater, the way that if you're on stage or if you're watching theater, that you, you embody another discussion. And so within that theatricality, whether something's like really big or really small, we are then taking it on, even if we can't touch it. So if you're in a museum and you're not allowed to touch, you can still imagine what it'd be like to hold this little tiny sculpture. So I make some sculptures that just fit in your hand. And there's a privacy to that. And so if the concept that I'm working on is more of an intimate one, I'll adjust the scale for one audience to have. 
And so I think about the way that scale allows for a dialogue to happen where I'm having a, a more intimate experience and ev evolution of thought. But then like the big sculptures where the CDs, like say, it's like you feel like you could be enveloped in them, how I'm trying to create a sense of joy and awe within those pieces. Um, and so to really help that scope of sort of shock within the CD and DVD, the number that it takes to be able to weave together. Um, I've done some smaller ones, when I, but those like when they're collage, they do it. But that scale where you become a component, a player in a much larger space, um, I use scale in many ways as its own material. That makes complete sense. <laughs> uh, as you were talking, I was sort of thinking about a conversation that I've had um, in the class with some some fellow classmates and, and that kind of thing uh, about sort of this idea of like the miniature and how the miniature allows so much for the viewer to be able to sort of project their own idea or their own like personal experience onto the piece versus like what it's like when something is gigantic and sort of like uh, can can feel more uh, more dominating of your attention and in a different way, you know, whereas like the miniatures have the tendency to sort of like, oh, this is a cute little thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you can play with that too, right? Where, you know, you're, you're playing with the idea of this cute little thing being actually about this really messed up, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. social concept. Um, I just find that very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, whether we make something that holds space next to us as a sculpture, we, we are three-dimensional objects ourselves. And so if a sculpture is the same size as us, then we have to share space with it. And it's a very different experience than it being, again, tiny or if it yeah. being large. And so if it's architectural, how then we then start to engage and walk around and look up and squat down, um, all of that physicality for me. Um, I think about that when I think about designing, um, how do I wanna make something? Um, but a big part of that actually started, didn't start with sculpture, it actually started with drawing. Um, I did a lot of figure drawing and figure sculpture as an undergrad student at Notre Dame. And so um, spending all that time drawing the figure in space, thinking about body position and scale and proportion helped me now, whenever I design large scale, I'm automatically like putting like, how, where do I wanna be? How big do I wanna be in that space? Thanks to things like, you know, being able to work in CAD, you can quickly adjust um, all of those components to see how big, but even just drawing it out, um, even if it's a stick figure, it helps me start to think about like, what kind of engagement does this concept need? Am I miniature? Do I feel small or do I feel empowered? That makes sense. Um, yeah. So just another question for you out of curiosity on my end. Um, so mm -hmm. you were saying about, uh, TLC <laughs> that um, you guys hadn't like gotten to meet in person to talk about this project. Did you guys like personally know one another before sort of like creating this collective together? Like had you met, had you met in real life before or was this sort of like a email like, hey, I'm interested. Would you like, yeah. do this with me? <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, okay. Sort of like there was links. And so when I think about like teams, I think we, you know, sometimes we just have to recognize and who do we want to carry along? Who are we going to keep with us? Um, and so Tiffany Black, who's in that, she and I crossed paths when I was a professor at Hanover College um, in Southern Indiana. She was one of my students years ago. Um, and since then, she's gone to MICA in Maryland for graduate school and then has worked um, and lived in both Baltimore and then Brooklyn and, as mentioned, now Indianapolis. Um, and oh, and then Arkansas for a while. And so she was also a, a public artist. Uh, there and doing murals. So we've stayed in touch over the years. And somewhere in there, we were talking about something and this idea started to surface. Her and Christine, when they were undergrads at different schools, they both did a study abroad, international mm. study abroad program in Madagascar. Oh, and So they lived together there and got to know each other and they've stayed in touch. And this is, we're talking like, I wanna say like 2010. Um, and, and so not earlier. I think she was maybe earlier. Um, and so they've been in touch. So I had met Christine. And so as Tiffany and I were planning um, for a couple of other proposals we had developed, she she mentioned, I wonder you know, if Christine would be interested. And so up until that Santa Fe trip in October of 2020, no, I guess we installed it April of 2020. Uh, we, we had never been in the same space. So I had never met Christine except for on Zoom and phone calls and text messages. 
That's so crazy how how things like that work out, right? I mean, just like mm-hmm. we were talking about with, you know, I me recognizing your work and being like, how, where have I seen this before? And then, you know, me mentioning to you where I went to undergrad. Oh, <laughs> I almost right? taught there. Well, now I know. Uh, so crazy how little things small like that line up. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like, we, I don't know. It's huge, but it's small. Um, so we got a comment in here from uh, Megan O'Grady who says, Letitia, thank you for doing this. Do you have any advice for artists um, early in their careers seeking to build connections and collaborations? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Megan. And I look forward to um, working with Megan tomorrow in the graduate seminar. Um, We've been in touch leading up to me being able to be part of that class tomorrow. Um, And so when I think about those next steps, kind of like I mentioned, Mid-South Sculpture Alliance. Um, And so there's a lot of organizations and opportunities out there that seek students um, as you're getting out, like they can provide help. And so something like that organization, I think is a very giving one. And to be a member, to get all of their emails and everything, it's only $35 um, for a student to be a member. Um, And then if you're a member, you can then nominate yourself to apply for that scholarship. Um, But using organizations like that, to find out what are some of the potential next steps. Another thing, attending every talk you possibly can like this one, uh, because there might be something in my story and in my discussion that help you, but maybe it's not mine. Maybe it was the last speaker. And so if you haven't heard all of the speakers from this year that University of Boulder has brought together, who've taken the time and funded to be able to have all of these meetings, uh, go back, watch those. There might be something in those that help you reveal what those next steps could look like for you. But a big one, like those collectives, some collectives um, that I'm a part of, like the TLC one, we invented, right? We was like, hey, let's do this together. So don't don't feel you have to be by yourself. If you are an artist that works best by themselves, there's nothing wrong with that. But also you might find a way to have a team when you get out of school so that you're not 100% like just feeling like you got to do it separately. And so like, like TLC, maybe you create an organization, but like Land Report Collective or Project Vortex, um, we only, we work separately and we show our work together. So when we, when we apply for shows, a curator is getting to look at an exhibition that's about a theme that's really sort of drilling into a dialogue about land, but it also includes like representational drawing and painting and installation and sculpture. So it has a variety of components that audiences are able then to engage. And one audience might like one type of work more than another. And so I find collectives to be helpful, um, especially when get right getting out of school because it can help with that. But also like things like I mentioned sculpture trails, Four of my students are going to Sculpture Trails this summer as interns. So that picture, um, some of those artists, some of those people in that picture are artists that were there, like myself, to work for a week or so. But 20 of those people in that picture are interns. They're either undergrads or grads or somewhere in between. Um, And so I have two, three undergrads and one grad student from A&M Corpus Christi who've been accepted for their internship to be able to live awesome. at Sculpture, right? To live at Sculpture <laughs> Trails for the summer, to be able to get to know Jerry Massey and all of the crew that run that program, to make sculpture, to be able to learn more about pouring metal, to learn more about mold making, to help all the visiting artists that come in. So in that, they're then gonna have, a, their network, their team is gonna explode, right? In just a month, all the other people are gonna be part of their network. And so seeing opportunities like that, it means you have to take a risk and apply, yeah. But in that, you you can find other connections. God, that sounds so fun. I'm like, I need to go as soon as we get off of here and apply right now. Yes, 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 <laughs> um, yes, yes. yes. That's, it's such great advice from you also. You know, like I, we were sort of talking about this the other day and I just, I really wanted to say that I, I felt like it was such great advice for me to hear because sort of this idea of like collectives and groups isn't something that like I've heard very much about or really thought about all that much in in the past and as someone who you know works um in film in multidisciplinary areas and you know like i need a team to work with a lot of the time so um it's really nice of you to sort of like come and put that on our radars and remind us all that we don't need to do it all alone all the time um and you know there is a, a lot of you know, stress and pressure behind the end of ending of school. And, you know, how do you how do you maintain the community with, you know, sometimes everyone who's come here for this sort of a graduate program have moved from all over the country and then we leave and disperse. And 
so yeah, that's it's it's amazing to to hear you talk about. It. I love hearing how excited you get about collecting collectives. I think it's so awesome. Well, again, um, I, I I stay really busy. I love what I get to do. Um, I graduated undergrad in '98, um, and it was through the support of the faculty at Notre Dame that I found this path. And so I recognize like, but I didn't go to my first museum until I was 17. Um, wow. And so I've, I feel like I've played catch up. And so I was like, mm. if I'm going to do this, I was going to put everything I had into it and not hold back. It, okay. If I failed, it wasn't going to be because I didn't try hard enough. Um, it was going to be because of something else that was out of my control that I couldn't change. And so I do all I can, whether it's for my students or for my own practice or for my teams to be able to keep pushing forward. Um, and so when I, when I think about like what I get to do, I, I am always looking for more. And so how can I, how can I challenge what I get to do and challenge my own work to be as prolific and to take advantage of all of the opportunities because we only have a short amount of time to be able to do this. And so life yeah. is so precious. Um, but then, I mean, I, I don't want to be one of, you know, there's always like questions about like, you know, do you have any hobbies? This is my hobby. <laughs> I, this is, this, I, 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 I think about this a lot. Um, I think about materials and I think about discussions. And so um, I know there's lots of like questions about like finding your passion. I think about it in the way that might not necessarily be passion, but find your curiosity. What, what questions can you keep challenging and driving at? And so sometimes we all get a little tired. Um, sometimes we, we all get a, a little stressed out. And I find that those teams, those communities, those collectives can be the ones that can sometimes help either be there to support, to say, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to question. But then those can also be the communities that can help push us forward when we need that extra bump. Um, real quick story, Land Report Collective, we had... Um, all, all of our shows that were supposed to be like that summer of 2020 were, were like postponed and canceled. Um, and we were all online. I was teaching on Zoom like so many hours a day, trying to like find space for my students, helping them, like helping ways to be seen, for, like feeling, helping them feel seen, um, like trying to think through all of the things as everybody was trying to at the same time. And one of my colleagues on Land Report, specifically Jason Brown, I remember he brought up, he's like, why don't we put on our own show? He's like, I'm putting on all these shows for my students on Instagram so they can have thesis shows. Why don't we do it? And so he's like, I'm giving us, uh, you know, so we, we decided we had a deadline. And so we created our own deadline. Everybody had to make one new piece by a certain date. Uh -huh. And if I, if they hadn't done that, I had stopped making work. All of my work had moved to brainstorming like projects to do from home and presentations. Um, and so I was like, Oh, so all of a sudden I started, I went back to drawing because I couldn't be in the shop. I couldn't be in the studio. And so I went back to drawing. And if you go to my website, it's the, the long eight foot drawings of like telephones. It was in that one image in that show in yeah. Springfield. It's titled Tethered. And so the first drawing I did was about telephones. And so it was two telephones that are tied, tethered together. And I was thinking about when I was a child or when I was younger, trying so hard. We didn't have any cell phones. We didn't have a mobile phone or anything like how like you're trying so hard to get away from your siblings, at least I did, to have that conversation with your friend, like around the corner, that cord stretching. So you're being <laughs> tethered. And as my husband was Zoom teaching in his office in one room, I was in my makeshift office in another room. Our daughter was taking third grade classes in another <laughs> room, right? We were tethered together, but separate. And I couldn't, I did that drawing and that yielded a whole body of work that if it hadn't been for the push and the discussions we were having through Land Report and that challenge to do an online show, um, just a, I don't I, I I don't know if that work would have happened. And so sometimes we need our teams to help open up a door. And so sometimes we have to be that team for somebody else to help yeah. open up that door to help them feel again seen, recognized, and heard. And also give them reminders, you know, like a reminder, like, hey, we don't have to wait for someone else to make the plan for us. We can just do our own thing. I think sometimes as artists, we forget that we're like, you know, looking around for opportunities and like, uh, you know, hoping things will come our way. And sometimes we just forget like, hey, I could I could do, a, you know, a gallery show in my living room or, you know, anything. Um, so, True. yeah, True. very, <laughs> very wise wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, uh, you want one more story or oh, I'm here for it. <laughs> well, thinking about that, um, about like reaching out, um, I, I think back to like, when was a major shift? Um, and so a major shift for me was about 2008. Um, and I had just gotten tenure at Hanover College. So I was an associate professor. Um, and I had been applying to all of these like grants and opportunities and exhibitions elsewhere. Um, and not necessarily like local or regional. And it dawned on me, I was like, if any of these curators at these other places were to call someone in Louisville or Indianapolis, which were just like an hour, two hours away from where I was living, I was like, and they are like, we just got this application from this Letitia person. Do you know anything about them? I would have to say they would have zero understanding of who I was. Um, because I would spend all my time and energy at the college campus and making some works, but I hadn't really taken the energy and time to like make that next step. And rather than applying elsewhere, I turned it around and I looked locally um, in a couple of different levels. But one specific one, I reached out to Karen Gillenwater, who is a curator in Louisville, Kentucky, who I had worked with um, and, um, to make some sculptures for Georgetown College at the time. And I knew that she would probably be going to Art Walk in Louisville and I never had been. I didn't even know where the galleries were. And so <laughs> called her up, I was like, are you going to Art Walk? Um, and if you're watching this, thank you, Karen. Always, always. <laughs> um, and so I called her up and asked her if her and her husband were going to Art Walk and if I could tag along. So opening up that wall of vulnerability, like I want to do this. Um, and so then she says, yes. So I go and I like to think I'm like, like I, kind of an extrovert, but more of an ambivert because I too like need to be by myself sometimes. Um, and I'll get shy like anyone else. I get nervous. Um, and I had to promise myself that in any gallery I went into, I would ask, I would introduce myself to three people. I couldn't leave the gallery until I said hi to three people and then I can move to the next gallery. And I did that and made some connections that evening that I'm still in touch with to this day. And one of them ended up being Jay Jordan. Um, who is a curator who's now living in Canada. Um, and he had an opportunity to show, have an exhibition. He had to choose one artist to represent him for a show in Indianapolis, thanks to um, Paula Katz, who was the curator up there, had asked him to ask some, you know, so it was like this like chain link thing. And he asked me, he, came, he paid me a studio wow. visit. And by the end of the talk, he asked me if I would be his artist. I was like, what? And so <laughs> that ended up being the first CD sculpture. Wow. Um, that I had never even thought of using the CDs ever. Um, and there were some other conversations that happened that yielded that. But I fully recognize like taking that step back and uh, letting someone else help, saying, yeah. I don't know, I need, I need um, some support here, um, opened up a door that to this day continues to evolve. And so I, I think of all of those CD sculptures, if you go to my website, all came from those first conversations. That's great. I, so, it can be so scary sometimes to sort of like get yourself to just jump in and say, right? hey, it's me. <laughs> Here, this is who yeah. I am, uh, you know, but that's, it's important to to remember to do that when we can. So mm -hmm. thank you. Trying your uh, own way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's been so great talking to you. And like, I feel like I could talk to you forever, <laughs> but that's okay. We'll get our moment. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was so great of you to come and do this. Thank you so much again. You're welcome, Brianna. Thank you for being my, my partner in this evening. And thank you to everyone at University of Colorado Boulder for creating this series, for continuing to bring in voices from all across the country and internationally to be a part of this conversation with your students. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Great.